Wow, uh, some really, really good presentations, some really, really smart people. And uh, I'm going to take us back a little bit uh, and share the story of a major uh, national retail uh, property landlord who uh, has embarked on a transition to BIM. And there was a catalyst for that. And this is basically the story for that. And uh, I'm uh, kind of represent the owner's position. We happen to be uh, uh, integral in the start of that process, but uh, I'm going to do my best to impersonate uh, Aaron Bryant, who is the uh, Senior Director of Design and Construction for uh, Crombie, and see if I can relate his uh, feelings and his story and why they've begun this transition to BIM. And it's all going to center around the uh, Avalon Mall project. And uh, it's really the beginning story, pardon me, it's really the beginning story of this uh, landlord's decision to leverage BIM uh, on a large-scale cosmetic renovation uh, and a site redevelopment of the Avalon Mall. And if anyone's familiar with that mall, it's in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland. So I'm going to try and bring a little bit of an East Coast Atlantic flair. And uh, as we go through this presentation, you know, one of the things that uh, I feel is uh, important to note is just how far this owner has progressed in uh, probably a year to a year and a half in their, uh, not only their adoption and understanding of BIM, but how they put it into place and the confidence they have in the technology and what it can do for them and for their clients as well. All right, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, uh, anybody here familiar with who Crombie is? Uh, they are a real estate investment trust. Uh, they're pretty much a household name across Canada, I believe, uh, in the retail mall. They're the strip mall kings, as we call them. Uh, very, very uh, large presence in Atlantic Canada. They're headquartered in Nova Scotia. Uh, they've been a long-time client of ours, and so it was an opportunity for us to engage uh, with them in a different form of service than what we traditionally provide. Servant Dunbrack is a, uh, a land survey and civil engineering firm, so some people might wonder why we're up here talking about BIM, and I think as we get through the presentation, uh, you'll start to understand how we got to be involved. A little bit about the mall. It was built originally in 1967. It was uh, the largest mall, and I think it uh, continues to be the largest mall in St. John's. And uh, it was getting a little dated. Uh, time for a, a, you know, a refurbishment, a refresh, call it a modernization. And uh, so that was really the starting point of our relationship with Crombie on this project. As you can see from... Uh, oh, pardon me. Um, Here's a Bing image of uh, the Avalon Mall. And I don't know how well that's coming across, but for any of you in the, uh, in the construction business, you'll note that there's a number of elevation changes. So what does that tell you? That over the uh, years since the mall was built in 1967, it's undergone a number of expansions and renovations. And uh, internally within Crombie, uh, it's kind of referred to as the Franken Mall. Uh, if you've ever been there, it is uh, one of the you can get lost in there very, very easily. And not only is it difficult to navigate, but from a, you know, from a design point of view, there are elevation changes within the floors as you go from one section to the other. So it's a pretty daunting uh, task to think about having to redesign this. All right, so the big challenge for Crombie when they set out on this project was because it had undergone so much change over the years, you know, they had a lot of design intent drawings, they had a lot of as-built drawings, but they were, uh, for the most part, untrustworthy from their point of view. So since they were undertaking a master replanning of this mall, they had a daunting task, and that is how do we acquire, how do we uptake so much information uh, so that we can use this in our planning process? Uh, they lacked any and all records that they had any faith in, as, you know, as it says here. Very large site, over 100 acres, uh, is both the retail mall and a number of commercial properties on the site as well. Uh, just prior to engaging with Crombie on this project, I think they acquired the last commercial building. And I happen to know several of the tenants in that building from my previous uh, career before I joined Servant Dunbrack. And I don't think they knew their building was going to be demoed. Uh, and we only learned that because uh, at some point during the discussion with Crombie, uh, when we were working out the fee schedule for our role in it, uh, we got a call from Aaron. He said, ah, don't bother with that building. It's coming down. And I went, ooh, geez, I wonder if the tenants know about that. Anyway, just a little side note. Uh, and they had engaged the services of a, an architect in Toronto, Pello Architects, who were going to help them uh, you know, redevelop this and do the master planning. 
Okay, so at the same time that Crombie was undertaking a redevelopment of this mall, uh, they had been exploring the benefits of BIM. You know, they'd had a number of their consultants talk to them about it previously, that they were already using it on their projects, even though Crombie hadn't asked for it. Uh, we servant Dunbrack happened to have gone up there and had a chat with them. Um, part of what we offer, and you'll see that as we go through the presentation, um, we uh, created within our own survey and civil engineering, mostly land development, uh, a little business within a business. You're all familiar with the, the notion of scan to BIM. So myself and, uh, and others within the company, we have a little scan to BIM department. So we went up and talked to Crombie and said, hey, here's what it's all about. Here's how it can help you. It's all about having accurate existing conditions. Uh, so at that moment, Aaron and some folks at DSRA, an architectural firm in Halifax, were working on the redevelopment of a very marquee property in Halifax called Scotia Square. So it was at that time that Peter Connell, the uh, managing partner for DSRA, said to uh, Aaron, you know, we've kind of got an existing conditions BIM model that we created of Scotia Square, but it's based on your old as-built drawings. And as architects, we all know owner's information, you know, we don't want to rely on that exclusively. We go out and do our own verifications. So Aaron and Peter decided that it would make a lot of sense for uh, that uh, facade where the change was going to occur to be scanned. So we were fortunate to be the ones that had talked to uh, Crombie and DSRA about that. So we did it. We scanned it. We produced a point cloud. DSRA were already well steeped in the use of BIM. They're, a, a, you know, an Autodesk Revit shop. So we brought our point cloud down to, uh, to uh, DSRA, sat down with them, imported the point cloud into the uh, Revit model, and boy, did some light bulbs turn on. Uh, it was found that the elevations that the architect had modeled with the old as-built drawings didn't line up with our point cloud. Some of the windows didn't line up with the point cloud. But what was even funnier was the reaction that we got was, oh, well, your point cloud must be wrong. Well, anyway, turns out that that was not the case. So anyway, that was at the time that Crombie was, as I said, contemplating this whole redevelopment of the Avalon Mall, so very serendipitous. You know, we were there at the right time, and so Crombie decided that the best way to acquire the existing conditions of the Avalon Mall was to use this thing called laser scanning and scan to BIM. So fortunately, we were there, and that's how we got to play a part of that. All right. Okay, covered off a little bit, but uh, when you think about the Avalon Mall and the fact that they really wanted to start from scratch, they wanted to acquire a set of existing conditions that they could have faith in, trustworthy, reliable, all those things, um, recognizing that it was a huge, huge site, they wanted to gather all this information, they wanted to accelerate the uptake of it, meaning once we get it, we want to have it in a format that is easily understandable, we can work with it, and we don't have to learn a new science. Uh, 3D visuals are going to be very, very important. We all understand that. One of the big reasons is they needed that information to be uh, computable, so they needed to take things and information away from it. But their team, the project team on this redevelopment effort, was scattered across the country, not only from their consultant's point of view, but folks within Crombie that were responsible and involved in this, they were scattered across multiple offices as well. And, of course, everybody wants to save time and money. When Aaron took this project to his management, um, they hadn't even started BIM, you know, and most of the folks within his organization responsible for uh, budget said, okay, what is this thing called BIM and why are you asking for this big chunk of money? Well, Aaron took a leap of faith um, and he felt that this was the best way to do it, so off we went. Okay, a little bit about the logistics. Uh, in our business, there's always a little bit of one-upmanship. And, uh, you know, when we put crews on site and we said we did these many scans in these many days, within the scan to BIM service bureau, uh, service bureau world, there's always a little bit of that going on. But just to put it into a scale from a con or context from a scale point of view, we had two crews, only one scanner, uh, 10 days on site, continuous data collection. And the reason we had two crews is we ran a day shift and a night shift. We did this in August of 2014, and you can appreciate that towards the end of the summer, every student who's getting ready to go back to school is hanging out at the mall, getting what they need, and to try and scan the interior of a mall when you had, you know, 10,000 young people running around was probably not a good idea. So we did all the interior scanning at night, all the exterior scanning during the day. Uh, 
almost, well, actually almost uh, 300, 400 scans, but 130 gigabytes of data, and we processed that down to about 19, and we used, of course, traditional survey to uh, um, uh, uh, geo-reference the scan data. What was important for Crombie was not just having 3D visuals, but having a model in the end that was, in effect, reality. They could use that model not only to you know, compute measurements and stuff like that, but because the whole site was being redeveloped, the entire model had to be geodetic or georeferenced so they could pick off elevations, things like that. So as surveyors, we understand that. Okay, the deliverables for the project for uh, Crombie were they wanted BIMs of all of the exterior uh, of the buildings on site, the retail mall itself, all the commercial buildings, uh, but most importantly, they wanted an, uh, an interior uh, model of the retail mall itself. So two shopping levels, a parkade, they wanted all those modeled. For those of you who understand LOD, it was all done to an LOD 200, space and place, uh, which is all they really needed at that point. It was for their feasibility analysis and planning. And uh, we modeled to all the uh, storefronts, you know, the common areas, things like that. We didn't go inside the store, that would have just taken the scope and you know, made it almost uh, darn near impossible for them. Uh, now here's, uh, here's an interesting thing that happened for us, and it's, uh, it was a valid lesson for us, it was a very important lesson for us. The word assume. Uh, Aaron assumed that we were going to produce an updated topo from our work. But when we went back and looked over the uh, agreement and the scope and stuff like that, there was nothing in there to say that we were going to do a topo. But because that's what we had done for them all the time in our traditional role as surveyors and engineers, so when we came away from that uh, phone call from Aaron, he said, okay, so where's my topo? We went, ooh. Well, fortunate for us that the techniques that we employed, uh, employed while we were on site made it very feasible for us to extract all the topo information, and we were able to eventually provide them with a, an updated topographical survey of the site. And the benefit to us was it was a very valuable learning experience. We're now pretty good at extracting <laughs> topo information from a scan. All right, and then that was re-imported back into the BIM model. Um, there's Aaron on the right. Um, if you know Aaron, he's a very, very soft-spoken man. So uh, for him to say more than five words about anything is, uh, is difficult, but this was a little commercial for Servant Dynabrack. We did a case study uh, and actually part of the basis of our submission. And uh, the part that I like the most is the very end. He says, unlike 2D drawings where you don't find out about an error until it's too late, 3D scanning and modeling allowed us to determine that up front. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? So that was good validation for, uh, for what we said. More importantly, it uh, showed to Aaron's team that, you know, they had the right idea in the first place. These are just some quotes from Aaron. Uh, we did an interview with him, and, uh, and these are some of the things that came right out of that. By getting the existing conditions verified and accurate, oh, it's better here, for our uh, pro forma, as he called it, in concept design work, we could transfer that right into the design uh, development and tender drawing package. In other words, it just made good sense. And if we go back to that time where he was making that decision, this wasn't something he articulated to us, but you know, over time we learned about this, and you know, uh, in hindsight, it does make perfect sense. If I'm going to go to all the trouble of acquiring this information and modeling it up, I want to be able to use it beyond just the feasibility analysis and the planning. And so that was a very key for uh, Aaron. Uh, the main thing it's given us is a greater degree of confidence in the accuracy of the documentation when we're looking at our own designs and others. Now, at the start of the presentation, I said, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is the evolution that Crombie has gone through from basically a 2D world to a 3D world. Not all of their processes today are strictly within the 3D realm. You know, they're still employing 2D uh, tools. And in fact, on this particular project, um, they, as I said, they haven't gone out to uh, uh, tender for the uh, design and development yet, but they use the model for verification. And that's to be certain that their own 2D documentation is accurate. They're still, you know, utilizing their own 2D documentation for feasibility analysis and planning and, and looking at various different concepts. But because they have the model, they have the faith in the model, then they're comfortable still using their 2D processes. So, you know, we've seen some presentations of some owners, you know, like Brookfield that are well advanced in their use of BIM. You know, here's an example of where an owner is really just starting down that journey. So it's a bit of a hybrid approach. Still a little bit of 2D, still a little bit of 3D. And these are just some images from the mall. Um, 
Again, because they have, that allows them to uh, generate uh, budgets very quickly from the various different concepts. That whole feasibility analysis, right? And they're still very much in that phase, and it supports, you know, a, a more rapid uh, decision making. We all talk about saving time and money. Um, here's a key piece for them: the ability um, to take different views from inside the mall uh, and look at it in more detail, and to help save time when you're evaluating these options. And uh, with the 3D visuals, both the model. Uh, and if, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, you know, the scan to BIM, whether it's a Faro platform or a Leica platform, you've got these virtual site access or web shares, we call it. Um, Crombie had never heard of that. So when we first started showing them that, you know, it, it was one of those moments where you go, where's this been all our life, right? And since the mall was in St. John's, they're in Nova Scotia, the architects that are doing the master planning in Toronto, it was just such a godsend for them. Um, so, I mean, they literally can jump inside, not the Revit model, but they can jump inside the TrueView, so, you know, a like a platform, and literally pick up measurements anywhere. Uh, the model that we produced for them uh, as land surveyors, you know, we uh, certified the accuracy of the model, and within inside that building, we are within millimeters uh, accuracy. So, you know, when you're going through a feasibility analysis, you don't really care about millimeters. But if you're now going to take that model and move to design development, you got to have faith that the model is very accurate. So uh, it was very, very helpful for them. Now, um, I said that they're not using the model for design development. They haven't moved to that. They're not even using the model today to explore different design concepts. They're still in a bit of a 2D world. But the model's there. And you know, uh, within their organization, they're already finding ways to take advantage of it that, um, for most of us, probably seems intuitive. For a firm that hadn't had this kind of information available to them in the past, it was one of those, again, eureka moments. If you've ever managed a mall and uh, you get constant calls from your tenants, say, hey, look, we're going to put up a new sign, we're going to change our storefront, and then there's this process of acquiring this information. The tenant requests you know, uh, that they get some uh, detailed information. Uh, the tenant fit-up manager at Crombie, her name is Michelle, she'll call the uh, property manager there. If he's around, if they've got time, they'll go and take the measurements, write them down on a piece of paper. Those come back to Michelle in the form of an email message. They drop a 2D drawing, then send it off to the tenant's architect. Well, I actually have a model there that I can trust because it's accurate. Now, in just five to 10 minutes, we can export a 2D uh, drawing and a 3D view directly from the model to send to the architect. You know, so much more efficient, better tenant support, and, improve, of course, improved client service. So there's just some low-hanging fruit that they've realized is a benefit, and it's continuing to reinforce their faith in their own decision to go this route. All right, and there's an example where the Gap wanted to do some changes, and uh, so there's how they were able to pull those 2D views right out of the model, as well as some 3D renderings. Okay, now they're continuing to enhance this model in several ways while it's still in this uh, on the sidelines form, shall we say. Uh, they uh, worked with a local structural engineering firm in St. John's uh, who are pretty much familiar with every square inch of that mall because they've been involved in a lot of the uh, original design, construction, of course, all the renovations. So uh, they've been adding the structural elements uh, to the model. Uh, it was kind of an interesting moment for us here at Servant Dunbrack. You know, we feel such a, an attachment, an emotional attachment to that model that when somebody else started messing with it, we kind of thought, ooh, geez, how are they doing that, right? How are they verifying all their elements? But you kind of have to let that one go, and we did. Uh, Michelle and her staff have actually been taking our model and completing all the interior partitions within the tenant spaces, right? I mean, most of those drawings they already own, BOMA certified measurements for lease management. So they've been involving the model so that at the end, they'll have a complete interior uh, model that reflects both the common areas to the store facades and, of course, the interior. And that's going to give them some opportunity as well. Um, you know, they expect that once the interior model is completed, it can be used for lease management and all those other things that we kind of see as fringe benefits, but really do add to the overall value of the approach. As I said, they haven't gone out for proposals for design development because they actually haven't settled on, you know, exactly uh, how they're going to redevelop it and how they're going to phase that. But, you know, we, we, one of the things we talked to Aaron about at the very beginning was the ability to offset costs. You know, the first thing that Aaron says is, okay, I'm going to spend all this money. I know it's going to help in our feasibility planning, but boy, where do I get some more savings back, right? And, you know, one of the things that we tried to communicate to him was, 
that if you've already collected all the existing conditions, it's one less thing that the consultants have to do. So, you know, and there's a cost associated with that. So he expects he's gonna recoup some costs there. But the thing that was most important for Aaron was that everyone will have a consistent view of the site. You know, nobody's gonna interpret what they thought they saw when they did a little bit of a site visit, took some of the existing as-built condition drawings. Everybody's gonna have a consistent view of the, of the site so that when they start to plan out their design, mm, there shouldn't be a lot of variances. So that was a key one for Aaron. Um, some of the uh, views of the mall, these are all just taken from the, uh, from the uh, Revit model that was produced. Um, okay, so now where are they beyond the Avalon Mall? We talked about that uh, the model is essentially on the sidelines right now, but just in embarking on a transition to BIM, how has that changed the way they do their business today? Uh, well, as I said, it kind of kicked off their transformation. Um, but they kind of took the bull by the horn. Um, I mentioned a, a woman's name by the name of uh, Michelle Zunti. Uh, she came to Crombie just at about the time the Avalon Mall project was starting. And Michelle had worked for a firm previously in Ottawa. And the idea of going back to a 2D world uh, and, and doing things up in, uh, in AutoCAD was not something that she thought was a great way to, uh, to uh, add value to her role there. So Michelle, as I said, took the bull by the horns. So now everything, you know, site plans are modeled up uh, using BIM. Uh, topography is imported, uh, you know, that they get that from their civil consultants. And they use this concept model to, you know, do what we always want to do, explore design concepts quickly, efficiently, and without having to redraw everything. You know, so it allows them to do such things as optimize for sight lines, for parking capacity, traffic patterns, and stuff like that. Things that you can't really do, you know, in, easily anyway in, in a 2D world. These are just some of the examples that uh, Michelle shared with us. You know, developing the site plan that, you know, although it looks like it's a 2D drawing, it really is from uh, a BIM model. Uh, and then just doing some basic massing and then studying the sight lines, studying the, uh, uh, the access and things like that. So it's really made things a lot easier for her. Um, let me, hold on. There's one piece here. I thought, okay, maybe it's coming up. Yeah, anyway, stuff that we take for granted, those of us that are, you know, well along the, uh, the path to uh, using BIM in our projects, um, you know, clearly, once the building is drawn in 3D, it's very simple, you know, to modify the model uh, to suit a tenant's needs. And, you know, we all talk about this notion of getting to yes, because then the real work starts, right? Okay, now i got to do the drawings, i got to start planning construction. If we can get to yes faster, then, you know, we're certainly ahead of the game. Um, and there's one here. Uh, now... Here's the piece, when we interviewed Michelle about a week and a half ago, we had no idea that they had progressed as far as they had in, shall we say, their internal uh, adoption of BIM. Uh, Michelle said, oh yeah, no problem, we use BIM for everything. Okay, so explain it to us. Well, uh, they actually started, uh, they created a, uh, a standardized drawing template and includes a library of all of their most common uh, construction materials and, and finishes that are used in the majority of their designs. Remember, they are the strip mall king. So if you've visited any of the malls, uh, the strip malls that Crombie has developed and constructed, there's a certain consistency to the design and the layout. So it made it practical for them to take this approach. Quantity schedules are generated from these standardized designs and you know, exported for use out by their uh, estimators to start calculating some gross construction costs, right? So, you know, here's the, we're talking about BIM as a business. Here's an immediate value that uh, Crombie realized. Um, it lets us explore the feasibility of multiple design options of the buildings, and it's compressed that process. Remember, they were basically a 2D offline process. They've gone from weeks to, she said, in some cases, half a day. You know, we can go from uh, a basic idea of a layout, and within, you know, half a day, maybe a day, We've got visuals, we've got schedules, we've got gross construction costs, we can share that with, you know, our clients. It makes some very, very uh, rapid decisions. So again, something that's uh, really shown how quickly they've internalized the benefits of BIM and are just using them every day. And again, another example, uh, they had a property that was an office building. Uh, they wanted to redevelop it as a hotel. Uh, so using visualization, they were able to put together a package, give it to their lease consultants, and start to shop it around. And 
And while you and I might take the whole notion of visualization for granted, been there, done that, uh, again, this is a client that, you know, has really only just kind of come into their own. Uh, and so their lease agents who were in the past getting, you know, 2D drawings and, and maybe some Photoshopped images, they get this now and it really helps enhance their conversation with their clients. So again, just another benefit for them. Another rendering of the, uh, the interior of the Avalon Mall. Uh, again, of course, it's much easier for them to show a uh, potential tenant a 3D rendering than a 2D drawing. All right, so the bottom line for Chrome, and this is just kind of wrapping things up here, is even though they're, uh, by national terms, still very uh, in the early stages of their transition to BIM, uh, they are fully committed. Um, you know, they've realized some significant benefits uh, on the Avalon Mall project, even though they haven't progressed the model beyond the initial capture and modeling that we did. They know in time and they expect it will give them a lot of benefits, but they're starting to realize a few benefits today. And the last question we asked Aaron uh, is, okay, so you're using BIM internally. Are you going to start to expect, uh, start to request BIM deliverables from your consultants? Um, because one of the things we, uh, we, I'm going to say struggle with, but one of the things that, that we bump into in Atlantic Canada is just overall the, uh, the adoption of BIM in our region. You know, we think about it geographically, we always think, you know, south to north and, and west to east. Uh, and, you know, in the eight or nine years that I've been banging around in the Atlantic market, that, you know, there's still not an awful lot of use of BIM uh, at the construction, at the tendering phase. So it's always a question that we ask to a, a client that we deal with, are you going to ask for BIM deliverables? And Aaron said, absolutely. Um, and while that might seem like a, you know, a, a given, it's not always the case because in our region, uh, there's a lot of pushback from the consultants like, oh, you want us to work in BIM? So the owner backs off and off we go down the old traditional path. But I think in this case, uh, Crombie is going to be uh, vigilant in their uh, goal to stay with, uh, with BIM. Uh, and they've, uh, it's being done on the uh, Scotia Square project we talked about at the very beginning with DSRA. Construction is going to be utilizing the model. And of course, once they get to the Avalon Mall design development phase, um, it's going to be an absolute requirement that they design to that existing conditions model. And there's a few images. Now, I think if this works, um, this is a little uh, animation that we produced. Uh, I don't know if I can make it. Oh, there we go. Perfect. And this was done out of Navis work, so um, a tool that we use extensively as well. And, and this is really just intended to give you a little bit of an idea of what the mall looks like uh, from a model point of view, but the scale. Um, we think this was probably the single largest project that was scanned and modeled, um, maybe in Canada last year. I think in total we modeled well over 600,000 square feet uh, to an LOD 200. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think it's something to demonstrate that this uh, technology can be very efficient. Um, the question that we get asked a lot uh, by clients that we get in front of is, ooh, how much did that cost them? And when we tell them the number, inevitably their eyes roll back in their head, not because it's so much, but they can't believe we did it for so little. So, I don't know, maybe we left a little money on the table, I don't know. But I have no problem sharing with you. That whole project was done, including TNL. For less than $100,000. And the value to Crombie will be easily recovered. So there's this, that's a model that we produced. Some of you may recognize that. That's InfraWorks. Uh, everything on that site was modeled. The topography, all the commercial buildings, that's an aggregate. There's, there's 2D data in there, 3D data. There's a LiDAR lift that we got from the city of St. John. So that's it. Thank you very much.